Well, worship team, that was, uh, that was very special. That was really good. And Ian, that, that guitar playing for uh, I Am Dignified warmed my Northern Irish heart. And, um, but the whole, every, every song was just, just very, very powerful. Well, if, uh, if you're on the interweb and have the Facebook, uh, you might have heard that uh, our family had a loss this week. Uh, my sister passed away on, on Friday. Uh, we, got, we got word, um, we'd known for five years that she was, uh, her kidneys were failing and she was gonna pass away, uh, which has been a blessing in some ways because it gives you an opportunity to, to grieve and say what you need to say and, and uh, say goodbye. Uh, but when that moment comes, you're still caught off guard, even though again, we, we knew that day was coming soon. So when I got the text from my mom on the Friday morning, I wasn't surprised. I quickly grabbed my a bag and started going up north. And I remember before I got in my car, I said, okay, Lord, I need your comfort to be close. And he says, I got it. And um, so we're driving up and I'm, I'm praying, Lord, you know, look after her. And, and really my whole prayer since knowing that she's going to pass was that she would, it would be painless. It'd be a peaceful passing. And um, so when, uh, when I'm driving and I kept, I, I pray, Lord, look after her and, I, and I'd hear, I got her, I've got her. And I kept driving and pray again and I've got her. And then um, when I was about 40 minutes out, out of nowhere, I heard, I've got her. And I knew what that meant. Sure enough, 10 minutes later, I got a text. Uh, don't ask me how I read it while I was driving. Um, but she said, where are you? And I was about 25 minutes out, and I, but I knew at that moment what, um, what it meant that my sister had passed, but she passed again peacefully. No pain at home, surrounded by uh, my parents. And um, so we're very, very grateful for that. And uh, your prayers and your support have been amazing. I've been very appreciative. And uh, I just ask again, you continue to pray for my parents because uh, they got a, a whole new world coming up ahead of them. So, all right. Well, we're going to continue on in our study in the, in the book of Abraham. And uh, we're, we seem a little hot up here. Is that? It is. Okay. Um, so if you want to turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 12, we're going to continue on uh, uh, our study. And this morning, actually, we're going to get to know his wife, Sarai, a little bit. Uh, but as you turn there, a little bit of trivia. Uh, it's been roughly 2,000 years since, uh, from between now and when Jesus walked the earth as a man. And then 2,000 years between, before Jesus, Abraham walked the earth, and roughly 2,000 years before Abraham, Adam and Eve walked the earth. So you've got these kind of 2,000 year seg uh, segments. I don't know if that means anything, uh, but it's just kind of interesting to me, a little bit of trivia, but it gives you a little bit of perspective on, on where things fall on in the timeline. Uh, but this little bit of trivia I do think is interesting. In the first 11 chapters of Genesis, it covers that 2,000 years between Adam and Abraham, uh, about 1920 generations, and that's covered in 11 chapters. Uh, and then the next, you know, 39 chapters are going to cover just four generations and just a few hundred years. In fact, even in the, the, the chapter 12 to chapter 25 is the life of Abraham, which covers 100 years of his life. That's you know, do the math on your own. It's 14 chapters right there in just a hundred years. So clearly the writer who's Moses is slowing down. And I think for good reason, because there's a lot for us now to learn. There's a lot in there for us. And so now they're taking their time and they're telling these stories in more detail. And, uh, and so this morning, we're gonna look at one of those stories in the life of Abraham, but it's not one of his highlights. It's not one of those moments that was, you know, is going to, to, you know, things that he's gonna be cheering about. I was playing hockey recently, gave up a really bad goal. And I thought, thank the Lord that this is not on a highlight reel anywhere, right? That no one's videotaping this. Uh, well, this is one of those moments that I'm sure Abraham wishes it was not included, but that's the beauty of scripture is that scripture includes the warts, the celebrations, the, the failures, the successes of many of our heroes. Think about David and Bathsheba. Or, or Solomon and Samson with their many failures with women, or, or Elijah playing the victim card, right? Where, Lord, I'm the only one that hasn't bowed a knee, and I'm the only person that trusts you. And God says, it's okay, there's 6,000 other guys, you're not alone. 
but he's playing the victim card. Or, or you've got the nation of Israel and there are countless times of failing to trust God, or even Peter's denial of Christ in the New Testament. And so the, these great heroes, great men and women of faith, their entire stories are laid bare for us. And I'm sure no one likes to be the example of what not to do or the example of the failure, but please understand when you think about Abraham, chances are you don't think of his failures because he's not defined by those failures, he's not defined by the successes. In fact, the, the number one line that defines who Abraham is, is who his friend is. That Abraham was a friend of God. And that's really what defines him. That's the most important thing we, we get to know about him. And really, I think in the life of Abraham, in this study, we get to discover what it means to be friends with God. So let that be our goal. Let that be our prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are close because you're here, you're with us, you're in us. You can't get any closer than what you and I have right now. We're one with you. And so Lord Jesus, this morning, as we study your word and we get to know your friend, I pray that we would understand what it means to be friends with you and what you're asking for, or looking for, and even offering to us today. So we're gonna trust you as best we know how. May your spirit be the teacher. In your name we pray, amen. All right, so if we wanna start in Genesis chapter 12, verse 10, that's where we're gonna kind of begin. And so last time we were in this, we were kind of looking through how God called Abraham and he left Mesopotamia, he left Ur and he came south and he was traveling through Canaan and, and got to the southern part of Canaan in Negev. Now in verse 10, it says, now there was a famine in the land. So Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there for the famine was severe in the land. So he's in this southern part of Israel, of Canaan, and this great famine now is going to strike. And, and really, it doesn't take much for a famine to hit that part of the world. There's, there's no natural rivers. It's not like the Egypt's got the Nile. Uh, Persia would have had the Euphrates River. And so there's a natural uh, source of water. Canaan really depends on rainfall. And so a little bit of a drought, and that leads to a great famine. And so it's very easy for them to experience that kind of uh, of desolation, I guess. And, and so Abram decides to sojourn down to Egypt. Now there's a $6 word there, sojourn. I had to kind of look that up a little bit, but basically what that word means is to live as a foreigner. So to give you an example from Joy and I, uh, our lives, there was a time there, a brief period where we lived in Toledo. She was going to school at Toledo for her master's in piano performance. And I was, I was working in Detroit uh, or just North of Detroit working for Chrysler or at Chrysler. And so we were living in Toledo, but it was never our home. We would never call ourselves Toledoites, Toledo Inns. I don't know what it is, but we wouldn't, it was never our home. We knew it was never going to be our permanent home. Uh, it was just a temporary place for us along the journey. And that's really what it means to sojourn. And the reality is that Abraham's doing that here in Egypt, that is not his permanent home, but in reality, he never had a permanent home anymore. As he traveled through Canaan, he was always a bit of a foreigner because the land was his, it was given to his, but he didn't possess it yet because that was to come later on when the nation of Israel would come back. But I wanna pause for a moment and examine the choice that Abraham makes here to leave Canaan to go down to Egypt. Now, we gotta be careful here because scripture doesn't say a lot about it. And so, you know, maybe it's just conjecture or inference on our part that we're making these conclusions of. But I do find it interesting, the response to the famine, or maybe more notably, the lack of response from Abram in when this famine takes place, right? That, that I think what's happened here is that he's taking matters into his own hands. You see, in Genesis 12, verse 8, where he's in that um, in Bethel or near Bethel, it says he built an altar and he began to call upon the name of the Lord. So he's calling on God. He's, he's looking to God to provide for him, look after him. And now this famine hits in verse 10, and we don't see that. We don't see him calling upon the name of the Lord. We don't see him reaching out to God. Instead, we see him picking up his tents and going south and, and finding uh, solace in, in Egypt here. And, and again, we can't be too dogmatic about this on this point here, but, but I think there's some other passages that kind of back this up. So turn in your Bibles with me to uh, the book of Isaiah. If you have a physical Bible, Isaiah is kind of in the middle. That's sort of the easiest way to find it there. But the uh, prophet Isaiah, chapter 31 and verse 1. 
And, and what Isaiah writes here, he says, woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses and trust in, harriet, in chariots because they are many and the horsemen because they are very strong, but they do not look to the Holy One of Israel nor seek the Lord. See, throughout scripture, Egypt is often portrayed as, as a picture of the world, as a dependence upon the world here. And so when Isaiah is writing here in 31, it's not that he's against the Egyptians per se, he's against the idea of looking to the world to be your answer, to be your provider, to be your savior, so to speak. And, and when we're doing that, when we're looking to Egypt, Isaiah is saying, we're not looking to God. And I kind of think that was the case for Abram here that God brought Abram to Canaan to provide for him in Canaan, but he never trusted God in that. Instead, what he did is he, he just took matters into his own hands. We have another prophecy, uh, another prophet, Jeremiah, one book to the right. In Jeremiah 17, he's speaking in a, in a metaphor, but I think it does apply even in Abraham's case here. So in, Gen in sorry, Jeremiah 17, verse five, it says, thus says the Lord, curse is a man who trusts in mankind, who makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. So this idea again here of, of the problem when we trust in our own strength, when we trust in the flesh, our own abilities, we trust in the world around us, Jeremiah says, you're gonna be cursed. You're gonna experience death. Verse six, for he will be like a bush in the desert and he will not see prosperity when it comes, but will live in stony wastes in the wilderness, a land of salt without inhabitant. He's going to experience a drought. He's going to experience problems because his trust is in himself. But, verse seven, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. For he will be like a tree planted by the water that extends its roots by a stream and will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaves will be green and it will not be anxious in a year of drought nor cease to yield fruit. See, again, I think God wanted to have the opportunity to prove to Abram how he could provide for him, how he could look after him. But Abram didn't trust that. Instead, when that adversity came, he trusted in himself. I say all that because let's pause for a moment. What do we do when adversity comes? Where do we turn? Where, where do we go? Where are we looking for to, to try to handle that, that adversity? For a lot of us, we turn to our own, our own abilities, our own resources, our own strengths. And then we finally exhaust all those paths. We exhaust all those opportunities. And then what? All I've got left is prayer. As if it's like the, the last, in case of emergency, break glass, pray. And that's kind of how we treat God. It's sort of when everything else has failed, then I'll turn to God. Really, it's the other way around. Turn to God first, and then he will show you how he will provide. And so really, that's, I think, what this passage is all about. Who will you trust in when adversity comes? And spoiler alert, in the life of Abraham, and, you know, just my own defense, it's a 4,000-year-old story. So it's not like I'm breaking new ground here. So spoiler alert, it doesn't go well for Abraham. Right, so let's continue on in the passage here. Go back to Genesis chapter 12 in verse 11. The story goes on. And it came about that when Sarah came near to Egypt, or when he came near to Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, see now that you are a beautiful woman. I know that you're a beautiful woman. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please say that you are my sister so that it may go well with me because of you and that I may live on account of you. So he's, he's getting close to Egypt and he's, he's looking at Sarai and he's thinking, oh dear, this is not gonna go well for me because they're gonna see your beauty. Because she's, you know, late 60s, she's smoking hot, right? Now that, that sounds a little silly. I'm not trying to put down any ladies in their 60s, um, but th th she really would have been kind of middle-aged. I think she, she was kind of halfway through the, her, her lifespan at this point. And so she's still looking beautiful. She's looking gorgeous. And Abram's looking at her going, they're going to kill me because they're going to want you. So listen, whoever we meet, tell them you're my sister. Now, he's not lying. It's true. She is his sister. We know that because later on, the same event is going to happen and he's going to play it all out again in Genesis chapter 20. And he says there that 
It's true. She is my half sister. So let's, you can turn to it. It's not that far in Genesis chapter 20. It is worth reading because there's some more insight into what Abraham's thinking at this point. So in Genesis 20, beginning in verse 11, uh, he says to this King Abimelech, uh, Abraham said, because I thought surely there is no fear of God in this place and they will kill me because of my wife. Besides, she actually is my sister, the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. And it came about when God caused me to wander from my father's house that I said to her, this is the kindness which, which you will show me. Everywhere we go, say of me, he is my brother. So again, he's not lying, but what's his motive? Self-protection. He's looking after himself. And so even before he left Mesopotamia, while he's still up in Ur, hasn't even gone into Canaan yet, he says, listen, we're going on this journey, but you gotta make me a promise. When we meet new people, leave the husband wife thing out because they're gonna take you and kill me in the process. And I, I don't know who's gonna protect me. They don't know who this God is even. And so therefore, I don't know who's gonna keep me safe. And, and so he's looking out for number one. He's already forgotten the promises of God. Remember the promises of God that we looked at last time in, in Genesis 12, verses two and three, about how I'm gonna bless you. I'm gonna make a great nation out of you. And those who curse you, I will curse, but those who bless, I will bless. I'm gonna provide, I'm gonna protect, I'm gonna care for you, Abraham. That was God's promise to him. And he's already forgotten it. And so, and now what's happened is he's struggling to protect himself by doing his own ways. Can anyone relate? Anyone? Good. We're going to do a testimony time. Christian, you want to come up first? And we won't do that. But we can all relate to that, right? Where we've thrown everyone else under the bus to look after ourselves. That's what Abram's going to do. But he's going to do it in a pretty horrific way here. Because what he's going to do essentially is he's going to prostitute his wife to save himself. That's what happens when he's, he's going to basically say, go ahead, Pharaoh, take her as your wife. And he's going to profit from that. Again, not looking after Sarai, but looking after himself. Number one. What we see here is a selfish man. And the impact of selfish men is incredible. You know, our, our world today uh, it would tell you that the problem is uh, the patriarchy. The problem is men have too much strength, too much control. And therefore the answer to that is we need to take the strength away from men. We need to, to weaken them so they're no longer a threat. And so if we had weak men, then no one would get hurt. The problem is it's not how it would work. Because the problem is not the strength of men. The problem is evil men and how they abuse that strength. The strength isn't the problem. It's the abuse of that strength. Let me, let me give you an example. Uh, each generation uh, kind of has its own name, right? You got the millennials because they were born around the turn of the millennium. And my generation is a generation X, which basically was, we don't know how to define it and we can't be bothered, whatever. X is just a stand-in, right? So I'm part of Generation X. Uh, my parents are from the baby boomer generation, which came after the war. And all of a sudden there's big boom uh, of, a, of, of births that came along. But what was the generation before the baby boomers? What are they called? The greatest generation. They're called the greatest generation. Now, how did they get that name? Did they just name themselves? No. No, they got that name because of World War II. See what happened, World War II is going on and you've got Hitler and the Nazis and they're, they're marching across Europe and we don't even know the atrocities yet of what they're doing. I mean, that's what's kind of terrifying is that the, the, uh, the Holocaust and the, the camps and stuff, they, they came out afterwards. They, they, we discovered that when we were liberating Europe. But what we did see is we saw a tyrannical dictator trying to take over the world. And what men did is they enlisted and they went to war. But what we saw women do is they went and they filled the gaps that these men were who were leaving and they went into the factories and they were now working long hours, 
preparing this, the, the uniforms and the weapons and, the, and the, uh, the armory that these men would need as they go overseas. And then they'd come home alone and look after the kids. They're called the greatest generation because of the sacrifice they made. And their strength was needed. Could you imagine if the strength of those men never showed up? that they were weak men and they just looked at and go, ah, I don't want to go to war. I'd rather go to jail than go to war. And so I'm not going to do that. And they just stayed home and sat on their hands. We'd all be saluting Hitler right now. The strength of men was needed and, and the strength of those women were needed because if they stayed home and they said, that's too much. We, I can't look after the kids and I can't go to work. I can't do all that. Then who would have made all the bullets and the guns and the, and the armory for these men going overseas? The strength of the women was needed. And so this greatest generation was, was rightly named because it was based on their sacrifice. And it's not lost on me that this coming Saturday, we're going to remember that with Remembrance Day. Where we're celebrating, we're remembering the sacrifice of these men and these women who fought for us, fought for others. Again, it wasn't like their own personal homes were, were, were under threat. They volunteer. Every single Canadian that's ever uh, stepped foot on a battlefield has done so willingly. I think that's amazing. We've had conscription, but they never had to go overseas to fight. Meaning every person that stormed the beaches of Normandy and, and fought at Vimy Ridge did so by their own volition. They sacrificed for themselves. And that's the strength that we need. Because when we don't see that kind of strength, when we see selfishness instead, people get hurt. We, we know the story of David and Bathsheba, but a, a lesser known story about David is later on in his life. In 2 Samuel 24, he's looking at his kingdom and he thinks, you know what? I wonder how great of a king I am. Let's do a census and find out. And God says, don't do a census but he did one anyways. He was tempted by Satan and he fell for it and he was deceived and disobeyed and he took a census and now he was confronted with that. And God says there's consequences to it. And I'm going to let you pick and choose. Uh, I'll throw you at the mercy of men or mercy of me. What, what do you want? And David rightly said, uh, don't, don't hand me to men. I throw myself at the mercy of you. And it says a plague swept over, over Israel and 70,000 people died. Because of David's selfishness, his failure to lead, his failure to do the right thing, 70,000 people died as a result. As I was preparing this week and I thought, I got the thought that says, you know, I, I should share a moment from my own life. And I, I, I wish I'd I could share more, but my mind doesn't work this way. I, I, I look at, at Josh and I look at Robin and how they get up and they share their stories. And I wish I thought that way, but my mind just works in concepts. But I knew this was important that I should share a failure from my own life. And so I said, Lord, okay, I'm willing to do it. And um, I just couldn't think of one. Um, <laughs> I asked Joy, she didn't have the same problem. I'm joking. I, I did ask Joy, um, but I already thought of one. And, and what she shared was around for the same time period. It's just that she had all the details to help me remember that. So thank you, honey. But, um, but it's from a time where my selfishness meant she had to pay the price. So you got to go back. Uh, it was December 2011. Uh, Caleb's not yet born, but, but he's around. He's just in, in the womb. And, um, and so we've got four other girls, four kids, six and under. And uh, it was in December and, um, and she remembers that because it was gonna be the first day of my vacation. And for me at the time, the fall was always a very busy time in the ministry calendar. Counseling was going and the courses and the conferences. And, and it just seemed like every day I was, I was off teaching somewhere at times. And that's probably because I was. And uh, so it was a very busy time. And so when December would come, it was sort of like, okay, good. We can finally catch a breath. And so for Joy, she had been kind of white knuckling it, holding on with her fingertips to get to that, that day. 
and it was going to be the first day off. And, and it was good because um, our kids are in gymnastics and they're going to do a showcase where all the, the great, you know, tumbling, which is just kind of a little elegant falling that they were learning was going to be showcased for the parents to see. And so uh, she was excited to have the help to have someone there. But at the time I got a, one of many emails from an employee head at the time who was struggling. And they, they were really struggling. They're having all kinds of emotional blowups. And, and so they sent me an email and I had a choice this moment. What do I do? Do I, do I address this blow up and, and meet with this person? Or do I put it off uh, for however long I need to, but then be there for my wife? And, um, and not in my defense in any ways, but, but in the time my thinking was, I'm still trying to establish myself. I'm still a young man in ministry. I, I didn't have the, the, the longer hair that I have now or the beard. So I looked like a kid. Uh, I know that because people said I looked like a kid. Uh, and, and when you're, you know, 20 years older than the counselor and you're struggling, are you really going to trust this counselor? So I was desperately trying to prove myself that I was m more mature and wise beyond my years, not because of what I knew, but who I knew but I was working. Again, I was working as many days as I could, teaching and counseling. And uh, on top of that now, I was, a, I was a new boss. I never had that in my professional career before where someone was under me and I had to now look after them and lead them. And I so desperately wanted a staff of many counselors. And I, this was an opportunity and I wanted to lead well. And so I was, I was gonna show grace and I was gonna show mercy and I was gonna do everything I could to make this person's successful. It's going to serve them. And that's, that's what I've been taught. But uh, no matter what I was doing for a number of months, it was just falling apart. This, this emotional blow up in an email was not a new one. It was, there was a pattern of all that. And that's because this person was in over their head. And I say that because I put them in that position. I put them in over their head and I, 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 despite doing everything I could to make it work, I couldn't. And so I knew the writing on the wall was I'm going to have to fire her and have to let her go. And I struggled with these thoughts because, because how can I teach grace and then let them go? So I was, I was resistant to that and I was doing everything I could, just trying to work harder and harder to make it happen. And that sounds noble, but there was a selfish thought in there as well because we're often people of mixed motives. We're not that simple. And so I had another motive in there. It says, if I let this person go, then what does it say about me? It means I'm a failure. It means that I'm not good enough, that I haven't, I haven't provided. I haven't, I, I failed to hire the right person. I failed to look after them. I failed to help them grow and mature. I failed to even counsel them in all this. And so I can't fail. And so what I did is I sacrificed my wife and my family to protect myself. I abandoned her with these four young girls. And I mean, I think two of them were into gymnastics and the other two were too young. I mean, one was, you know, still in diapers and she's pregnant and she's looking after all these kids, tired and exhausted and strung out while I go to protect myself. I made a selfish choice. I didn't sit there and think about that, but I failed as a man to protect my family. So I sacrificed her. I sacrificed her when she and the kids needed me the most. So you're not alone if you failed. Now, please, please understand this applies not just to husbands, applies to wives. It's not just a, applicable to men or, or to, it's also to women. It's, it's young, it's old, it it's applies to all of us because again, each and every one of us, our strength, our engagement is needed. You and I, we play a critical role. I know that because Ephesians 2.10 tells us that, that you and I were created with these good works in mind that we're to walk in. I say all that, but I do want to address the men in our fellowship for a moment. 
Because Abram's failure was that of a man. And, and you can hear this now in two ways. You can hear it in a sense of a, a form of condemnation. I could get up here like a, a famous pastor did and scream, how dare you? And, and try to you know, get you to work harder and do more and kind of beat you up a little bit and guilt you and shame you into being men, which is no man at all. So don't hear that. Instead, what I want you to hear, it's, it's an invitation and it's also a cry. You are needed. You are needed on the front lines. We are in a spiritual battle. It's much greater than World War II. It's much greater than what's going on right now in Israel. It's much greater than what's going on in Ukraine. It's a battle with an enemy that is coming after you and your family and your loved ones. This is not the time to be passive. It's not the time to check out. It's not the time to be selfish. Your strength as a man is needed. Let me read to you 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13. It says, be on the alert, Paul writes. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men, he says. Be strong. Don't let anyone ever tell you your strength is bad. The strength of a man is a wonderful thing. Just don't use it for evil. God gave you that strength as a man for good, to look after those who can't look after themselves, to look after those who are looking to you and dependent upon you. That's true for you young men. And it's true for your older men. And it's true for every one of us in between. Our strength is needed. All right, let's continue with our story. So again, we read about in, uh, <clears throat> you know, what Abraham's thinking and the fear he's feeling. And it turns out it's true. Verse 14, it came about when Abram came into Egypt, the Egyptians saw the woman and was very beautiful. Therefore, he treated, this is Pharaoh, he treated Abram well for her sake. Sorry, verse 15, Pharaoh's officials saw her and praised her to Pharaoh and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. Verse 16, therefore he treated Abram well for her sake and gave him sheep and oxen and donkeys and male and female servants and female donkeys and camels. This is where Abraham prostitutes his wife. He gets rich off of her as she now enters into the household where she will become part of Pharaoh's harem, where her job now for going onward will be to please her husband sexually and maybe even, maybe even uh, father children, maybe not. Uh, it's not really important in that sense. And in reward for that, Abram gets rich. Now notice what doesn't happen. We don't see Sarai, you know, putting up her hand or, or, or riding Abram out. By all accounts, she goes along with it. but I want you to see she does what Abraham didn't do. What she did in being silent was she was honoring her husband and therefore was trusting God to look after her. It would have been easy to take matters into her own hands, protect herself, throw Abram under the bus. I mean, he's doing it. Why shouldn't I? But she didn't. And I believe what she was doing in honoring Abram is that she was trusting God in the process. And I say that because some 2000 years later, Peter writes about her. So turn in your Bibles with me to first Peter. Keep your thumb in Genesis if you want, because we're coming back there. But first Peter chapter three. Peter, now he's been addressing relationships and he's been addressing how we're to, to uh, honor those who are in authority over us. Uh, elective officials, even if you don't like them or, or voted for them, they're there because God put them there. Remember that. So don't curse them, bless them, pray for them. And then in terms of your, uh, if you're an employee, pray for your boss and honor them. Even if they're a bad boss, it says, show them honor. Now in verse, verse one of chapter three, he says in the same way, so in that term of, of the view of submission, in the same way, you wives be submissive to your own husbands so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, 
Not just when they're good, not just when they're doing the right things, but even when they're disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. Your adornment must not be merely external, braiding of the hair, wearing of gold jewelry, or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also, who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, that you might become her children and that you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. All right, I got to give a disclaimer. I am not saying if your husband's abusive, you need to be quiet and just go back into that. I am not saying that if your husband says, hey, I know how we're going to take care of this inflation problem. Uh, There's a website that you can join where you can share some illicit images or videos of yourself. And that's going to help us get get us by. And you have to do it to honor him, respect him. It's not what I'm saying. And I'm not saying that if, if he says, well, let's, you know, open up the bedroom. Let's make it more exciting. Let's invite other people into it. And you have to honor him and follow along. It's not what I'm saying. In fact, if your husband is doing that, please come talk to one of us, one of the elders. We would love to protect you. We would love to honor you and have a conversation in love with your husband because he's not being the man he needs to be. So that's not what I'm saying, that you have to just go along and be quiet. But often, often there are a lot of gray areas, right? Those are the extreme scenarios, but there's a lot of in-between where simply the husband is doing something the wife doesn't agree with. It's not, it's not uh, unrighteous. It's not immoral. They just don't like what's happening. And so what does the wife do? She might run, her, run the husband down. Well, he needs to step up and be a better dad, be a better husband. He needs to lead more. He needs to do all these things. And that may be true, but motivating him by attacking him is probably the worst thing that you can do. Instead, you can learn from Sarah, honor him, show him that respect because that's what he needs. That's what he's looking for. And berating him is probably going to kill him, but honoring him will lift him up. And I've seen it time and time again in hurting marriages where it only takes one person to change. And when the wife has has adopted this understanding that it is a command to honor him and show him respect, That's that's her marching orders as a wife. That's what she signed up for in marriage because that's what he needs. That's the best way to love him is to respect. And when when she's doing that, that empowers him. And I've seen marriages healed and transformed just from that one act alone. Now, just so we're fair though, we're not going to stop reading in 1 Peter because it's going to go on in verse seven. Now it says, and you husbands, In the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way as someone weaker since she is a woman and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. Please understand weaker vessel. I don't think that means that physically weak or emotionally weak or anything like that. They're vulnerable. They're vulnerable because you're at, they're at our mercy as husbands. That's what makes them so, so precious is that you and I as husbands can cause so much damage to women, to our wives. And that's why they're trying to take the strength away from men so they don't get hurt, but they don't realize that if you rob the strength of men, then there are other evil forces out there that are going to just hurt you anyways. So husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Understand the gift they're giving you and they give you your heart their heart to you. Understand the gift of that respect and that trust and and step up to that and honor it by loving them well. Recognizing they're a fellow heir of the grace of God. And here's what's amazing. I don't know of any other place that says it this explicitly. If you don't, your prayers will be hindered. Meaning God will say to you, basically, you'll come to him and say, God, there's something going on. And I want to talk to you about this. And you know what God will say? I don't want to hear it. 
We're not talking about that. That's not important. Because you know what matters right now? It's how you're treating your wife. That's what matters. And I need to talk to you about that, son, because that's my daughter. And I love you. And that's why we're going to have this direct conversation because you need to learn to love her. So wives, leave room for God. Don't trust in yourself. Don't trust in your own abilities to protect yourself. Leave room for God and watch what he's going to do. And that's what Sarah does. By not, by not taking matters in their own hands, like Abram did, she leaves room for God to protect her. And oh, watch what he does. Back in Genesis chapter 12, beginning in verse 17. But the Lord struck Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. Then Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this that you've done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her as for my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him and they escorted him away and his wife and all that belonged to him. Pharaoh knew something was wrong. Now here's, here's an interesting aside. This is before the Ten Commandments. 400 plus years before Moses shows up with the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not commit adultery. It's 250 years roughly before something called the Code of Hammurabi. It's a, a code, a tablet they found in, in Babylon uh, that outli outlines all kinds of things of what not to do and what happens if you do. It's very similar to the Ten Commandments and includes like don't murder, don't steal, don't commit adultery. It's around the time of another code called the Code of Ur. It's not as if they don't have all of it, but it would have been in Mesopotamia as well. And it includes, again, don't murder, don't steal, don't commit adultery and other things as well. Now, why am I saying that? Why am I saying that this is significant? Because these things that are called sin are not because of the Judeo-Christian heritage that we have. We hear that from time to time where, well, I don't put your, your Judeo-Christian morals on me. They're not Judeo-Christian. They're just what's right and what's wrong. You see, what's right and what's wrong goes back to the garden. Remember the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What's right and what's wrong is just universal. It doesn't change. And the moment Adam and Eve ate from that, that tree, the knowledge of what was good and evil was implanted on their heart in, within man's conscience. And so when they wrote out these codes, the code of Hammurabi or the code of Ur, they knew what was right and wrong. And Pharaoh knew to be with another man's wife was wrong. The only reason that God gave the law was because what man was doing at that point was he was looking for loopholes. He was trying to find arguments. And even to this day, it happens. I've heard Jews that say, well, whatever happens outside of Jerusalem stays outside Jerusalem. It's like reverse Vegas. And so when God gave the law, he's like, let there be no doubt. This is sin. As the scriptures say, to shut up everyone under sin. There's no more argument. There's no debate. But it didn't, didn't become sin at, at Mount Sinai. It's always been evil. It's always been wrong. And even Pharaoh knew that. Now, how he knew that, we're not entirely sure. We don't know how he discovered it, but he did. And, but I imagine he's got this plague sweeping through his household. And in that time, plagues were seen as divine punishment. And so I imagine Pharaoh began to sacrifice to his gods and he began to pray and do everything he knew in his power, hoping that this plague would be lifted. But no matter what he did, his gods could not remove this plague because his gods that he worshiped were not nearly as strong enough as Abram's God, as Sarai's God, as Yahweh. And eventually he must've put two and two together and figured out when, when she came into the household, that's when it all fell apart. And maybe he understood that this plague was what happens if you have adultery. So he kind of put two and two together. So he confronts Abram now with three questions that are really rhetorical. He doesn't care about the answers. And then he gives judgment. He gives no, no space for Abram to speak. And he says, why have you done this to me? Why didn't you tell me that she's, that, that, that she's your wife? Why, why, would you, why would you hurt me in this way? And then he just throws them out together. God protected Sarah. It was a miracle, but God did it. And Sarah gave room to do so. 
But here's the incredible thing in the story. This is where God's grace shows up. Not only did he protect Sarai who trusted him, he even protected Abram. Think about it. If you're Pharaoh and this man Abram has caused a plague in your household, do you like this man? And what do kings do with people they don't like? Off with their head, kill him, right? That's normally the response that he would have punished Abram. He would have hurt Abram. But what does he do? Take all your stuff, get out of here. He didn't even take it back. Take your stuff and leave. You've, you've been a, uh, you haven't been an honest broker. You, you've been lying to me, but just take it and go. Because I don't want you around anymore. And you know why? Because he was afraid of Abram's God more than Abram was. See, Abram was more afraid of men than he was of God. But Pharaoh was more afraid of Yahweh than his own gods. He knew his gods couldn't defeat Yahweh. So he's just like, no one touch him. Now they frog marched him out, right? They grabbed him maybe and just sort of escorted him beyond the borders. But they dare not hurt him because they dare not incur the wrath of Yahweh and so what happens in this case, it's almost like Abram fall, fails, fall, uh, fails forward. Wouldn't that be nice, right? Every mistake you make, you still come out on top. Well, does this mean that the lesson is that we should sin more in order to get more grace? Great question. Paul knew that that was a question some might ask because he says in Romans 5.20, where sin abounds, grace superabounds all the more. So you might be thinking, well, I want more grace, so I should sin more to get more grace. Logical, two plus two equals four, let's do that. And Paul addresses that in Romans 6. He says, may it never be. God forbid. Absolutely not. That's not what the, the way is. Why would we do that when we, A, we've died to sin, but then he goes even further in, in Gale sorry, Romans 6, 14 to 23. And, and we're not going to turn to it right now because we don't have time, but you can read it when you get home. But he says that we're not under the law anymore. We're free from the law completely. So sin will not be our master because we're under grace. Well, does that mean I should continue to sin that I'm not under law? God forbid. And he says, because there's still consequences to your sin. That, that when you sin, when you, you fail, to trust God, there are always negative consequences to that. We saw that in the life of David. When he took the census, 70,000 people died. You saw it in my life. When I chose uh, my own selfish ambitions and reputation over my wife, my kids, they suffered. And she's still suffering to this day because of it. I burnt her out. She needed my strength. And that's why it's so important that today we be men, we be strong, we love well. But again, even in our failure, even in Abram's failure, God didn't abandon him. God protected him, provided for him, and he loved him because that's how God's grace works. So in closing, we need men of faith, strong men of faith, who don't live like Abram did in this moment where they trusted and entrusted in himself. We need strong women of faith like Sarai who trusted God, even though that made her vulnerable, but she trusted God knowing that God could protect her. And I'm not talking about strength as the world defines it. The world defines strength as being strong willed, self-confident giant walls of protection. So no one can hurt you. I'm talking about men and women who are willing to risk who are willing to be vulnerable, who are willing to trust Jesus and trusting Jesus to lead them as to where they're going to go. And then to trust Jesus to do it in them. That's Philippians 2, 13, by the way, right? That God's in you both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. And sometimes he's going to lead you to vulnerable places. Sometimes he's going to lead you in a position where you don't know how you're going to handle it. And that's when he says, good, because I don't want you to handle it. I want you to trust me and I will do it through you. I will empower you and I will pull it off. And when this happens, the church lives with power. We live with confidence. And quite frankly, that's what the world needs right now. It needs more church. 
needs the strength of the church because that's Jesus himself. And when the world sees Jesus, they will find what they're looking for. They will find that hope. They will find that love. They will find that acceptance. They will find freedom, They'll find life. And may we be that church. May we be that church at home. May we be that church in our workplace and that may we be that church here with our friends, even in strangers. May we be that church in Costco. I know it's a miracle, but he's a God of miracles. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that our strength is in you and dependent upon you. And we can trust you even in the hardest times of our lives. I pray, Lord, that we would be men and women of courage, that we'd be men and women of strength. We'd be men and women of integrity and honor. We'd be men and women who trust you because that's where it all flows out of. In your name we pray, amen. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that message and it blessed you as we discover more about this great life we have in Jesus. I wanna encourage you to, to like and subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. And also you can check out these videos here and watch more sermons and more messages. It really will encourage you in the, the joy and the power that we have in Jesus Christ.